see why we're lighting these candles is because we are getting every room closer and closer to Christmas. And the lighting of the candles represents the fact that Jesus is the light of the world. And the Bible says that Jesus is the light of the world, and whoever follows him will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And so as those candles shine brightly, we are reminded that Jesus shines brightly in our hearts, and also that we are to shine brightly for our neighbors and also for the nations. And so last week we lit the candle of hope, and lighting that candle we are reminded that Jesus is our hope, and we look forward to the fulfillment of his promises. A lot of times around here we say the word hope as if it's a wish. We hope our team wins the big game, but when we hope in Christ it is a fulfilled promise. We have a confident expectation that what God says will happen will indeed happen, for he is indeed our hope. And today we are going to light the second purple candle, which represents the candle of preparation. We prepare our hearts for this time of Christmas. And the scripture reading is from the book of Isaiah. In the book of Isaiah chapter number 40, we are introduced to a forerunner of the Messiah, and he was one that was to prepare the way for the Messiah. In Isaiah 40, verse 3, it says, A voice cries in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up, and every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level, and the rough places a plain. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed. And all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. And so John the Baptist came and prepared the way of the Lord, announcing that there was a Messiah that was to come, and that we need to repent of our sins so that we would be ready to receive him. In a similar way, we are to make sure our hearts are ready as we celebrate Advent. Advent is a word that means coming or arrival. And so when we think about Christmas, it is the first arrival of Jesus, but we also look ahead to the second arrival of Jesus. He is coming back. And so as we light these candles, we're reminded about what he did, why he came, but also the fact that he is coming back for us. And so with that, I've invited Charlotte and Joshua Puckett to come and light the hope candle and the preparation candle. If you all will light that at this time. Let's pray together. Father, we celebrate Advent because we know that this is a special time of year, knowing what it represents. Jesus, you came into this world, but the reason you came was to give your life on the cross. And so we are reminded of that. Our hope is in that. We prepare our hearts. And God, we prepare our hearts by coming and adoring you, giving you our very best because you're worthy of nothing less. We love you and we pray all these things in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Church, would you stand with us this morning as we sing about our coming King and the, the day that he came and, and O oh come, all you faithful, and worship with us today. Amen.
Give the Lord all the honor and glory he deserves this morning. Amen. And church, you may be seated.
talk about it. Well, amen. Praise God. Yes. We are ready to roll. Well, I, I'm excited about that. Thank you, Kevin. Appreciate you doing that. Welcome to First Baptist Church. It's a joy to see you today and Merry Christmas to you. I know this is an exciting time for everybody. If you're a first time guest with us, we are grateful to have you. You might have noticed in front of you that there is a card. The top scan here will take you to a connection card. We'd be grateful if you fill that out for us. Also, if you're a member, thank you for everything that you do. Thank you for your support, your encouragement. Thank you for your love, your ministry, for inviting people to this church. This is a wonderful church family, and the Lord is working, and I'm so, so grateful for you. And there's a lot that's going to go on today, and one of the things that we're going to have as part of our service is a testimony about Celebrate Recovery. And I'm going to pray, and after I pray, I'm going to invite Jennifer to come. Jennifer Arnold is here, and she's going to come and share a little bit of testimony about what God has done in her life through step study and what to look forward to and celebrate recovery. We have started, we're going to start celebrate recovery on January 8th. And I know you have an extensive prayer list, but I would ask that you would put celebrate recovery near the top of that list because we need to be praying for God to move in an extraordinary way. So January 8th, we're looking at about a month away now for uh, celebrate recovery to start. So let me pray. And then Jennifer, if you want to come, you can share at that time. So let's pray. Father, we love you today. So grateful for this time where we celebrate the fact that Jesus has come into this world, the word of God becoming flesh and dwelling among us. And it is a grateful time of reflection, of worship and praise. And Father, we're glad to be here. We're glad to worship with fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. And it is a glorious time. We're so grateful for our blessings that you have given us. And we're grateful for the responsibility to be salt and light in this world. And I pray today that today would be a day of rejoicing in what you've done in our hearts and in our life and what you're going to do. We're excited about what you're doing through our Celebrate Recovery ministry and what you're going to do, Lord. And I pray that you just be with Jennifer and give her the words to say that would encourage us all at this time. We love you and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Jennifer, if you want to come. So when I joined uh, Step Study, I really didn't know what I was getting myself into when I went to this happy meeting. So quickly I realized that I was about to have to get really uncomfortable and share things that church all night, which is not easy by any means, any means, and as standing up here for you right now, this is uncomfortable for me right now, so just bear with me, I guess I'll probably shaky as I talk, so just um, please, you know, have some patience with me, um, but as painful as what we've had to go through with step study, kind of going through our hurts, and who hurt us, and how that affected our lives, and also we had to even um, take a look at what our own self kind of self-reflective of like what hurts we have brought on other people and so with that that um you know really took a, a toll on me because some hurts that i've carried into my adult life started even as young as um six being six years old so and through that i think i always kind of held other people's um their sins or their struggles whether it was from addiction or not um that they were worse than mine you know, and I kind of held that onto that for quite some time and was not able to really make peace with some of that until I went and did step study. And I can honestly say that going through this, I found some peace, I found freedom, I found forgiveness, um, and especially with my dad. I know some people kind of know that story, but um, I was very judgmental over the struggles that he had. And while my struggles may not have been the same as his, um, I was no better than him. His struggles um, were not the same, and that's what we need to realize is we're all struggling with something, whether it be from addiction or whether it be, um, like with myself, I personally struggled with anger, bitterness, resentment, pride, my guilt, shame, and just plain brokenness that I experienced through a lot of the hurt. So 
while I was in my, you know, brokenness, um, I worked through that during a step study. And I, instead of turning to people and things in this world to make me feel loved or validated or just looking for something that was not of the Lord, through this, I realized that my self-worth, my validation needed to come from Jesus Christ. And um, no matter how many times I turned away from him and struggled over the years, the Lord never left my side. He has been patiently waiting on for me to turn over those hurts um, and those struggles to him. Because, you know, I don't know about y'all, but I'm tired. I'm tired of doing it on my own. And I think we get so caught up on trying to do stuff in our own power and our own strength. And if we'll just give it to him, there is peace. There is freedom that you can find in those hurts because no matter what, he is there waiting for us to give it to him so he can turn our lives around. Um, like I said, I just want you to know that that you can you can find these things that we look for in our everyday life from other things of this world, and it's not there. You're not going to find it. So just turn to the one that can just take it, the burdens away, the pain away, the struggles in this life, and he can do that. It took me until I was 42 years old to realize that. So don't waste your time, especially young ones. Don't don't waste your time seeking things of, that are not of this world. So anyway, but like I said, um, Step Study has been great. I thank you, Lynn, for uh, believing in us. Thank you, Kurt, for supporting her in this whole great recovery. And I think this will touch so many lives because if it can change such a sinful heart that I have had, and the struggles that I've had in my life, then I know it can help you too, whether it's addiction or not. It does not, Celebrate Recovery is not just about the addiction. It can be for all the struggles and hurts that we go through on an everyday basis. Yeah, church, would you stand with us this morning? We sing this great hymn in the church about surrender. It goes perfectly with what uh, Jennifer was just telling us about. Things we need to give up in our lives and give them over to God. I pray this morning that this is our prayer for you. Sing with us. You know this already.
You know, to us, evangelism and discipleship isn't just like one hour a week meeting with them and doing a Bible story or going through it. Living with them, being there with them, and then sharing scripture with them, sharing the truth with them. come to the city from the villages, they immediately are looking at in the face of the reality that they are invisible in the city. So the women are out there begging on the streets and people are walking by them constantly. They don't see them. They don't even acknowledge them. They don't talk to them. And so I think God's really opened up a door for us to come into their lives and see them. So we see their needs. We don't look at them as some invisible person or some number or some project. We look at them as made in God's image and people that deserve to hear the good news of Jesus Christ. So we started a project to help us gain access through their people. And this project helps them provide jobs. And it gives us a reason to be among them and spending time with them so that we can share the gospel with them. So there's one lady that we met through our ministry and she's really a leader among the community. And we were able to start meeting with her and her family and start sharing the Bible stories with her. We would go visit her every week, and we've just been faithfully sharing with her for over three years. And finally, about two months ago, she decided she wanted to give her life to Jesus, and we were able to baptize her in her community in front of the whole community, and she's able to testify what God has done in her life. The hope would be one day to be able to see Embera missionaries be sent out to their villages and share the gospel, share the God stories with people so that they can have enough information to follow Jesus. We just want to thank you all for giving to the Lottie Moon offering because without that, we wouldn't be able to do what we do. We're able to focus on our ministry. We don't have to worry about raising support and we're able to really just dedicate all of our time to sharing the good news with people who have never heard. So we can not spend all of our time, we can spend all of our time in, in missions and ministry. Foreign missionaries go because there is a need. God pulls them. I've been blessed to have quite a few with the foreign missionaries. They get in the door with a practical application. In this case, helping these women and children and recruit early living and develop some social skills and express the gospel. I read some statistics that you can find plenty of on the IMD board. 59% of the world's population are considered unreached. 59%. That's 4.6 billion people. Last year, the IMD supported 3,650 missionaries in 116 countries. That's 93 new groups of people that were reached. 22,744 churches were planted. 176,795 people became new believers. 176,795 believers against 4.2 billion. That's a drop in the bucket. We're running out of time. Just look at our world. It's getting worse and worse. Totalitarian governments are putting the screws to their populations. It's harder to get the word in. And this is the time of year that we ask you to give generously to the Lottie Moon offering because that's how we can get the word out there. 86% of the funds raised goes directly to supporting the Mission Mission. So please prayerfully consider what you will donate. You can go on the church website click under giving and click on missions and make a donation. You can write a check or put cash in an envelope and label it for Lottie Moon, but thank you. And I'm nervous because I'm anxious. I mean, the need is great. The need is great, and we need to do what we can to help those who 
answer God's call for his people. Amen. Thank you, Deborah. A very important offering. Our church goal is $10,500. And so give as the Lord would lay upon your heart. At this time, I'd like to dismiss the children to Children's Church, ages 4 through 1st grade, please. So glad to have each of you here. Merry Christmas to you. Well, I might have already left, I guess. All right. For everybody else, let's open our Bibles to the Gospel according to John. Gospel of John, chapter 1, will be our sermon text today. John, chapter 1. And as you're turning there, I do have a confession to make I'm a little embarrassed about. I accidentally used my dog shampoo. But now I feel like such a good boy. I hope everybody has a good Christmas. I do hope everybody has a good Christmas. But why do we celebrate Christmas? Every year about this time, we sing Christmas songs and go to Christmas parties and go to Christmas parades and we buy gifts for Christmas. But why do we go through all of that? Today, we're going to look at three reasons to celebrate Christmas from a text of Scripture that has no mention of angels or shepherds or wise men or Mary or Joseph or even a baby in a manger. Let's open our Bibles to John chapter 1, and I'm going to read verses 1 through 18, John 1, 1 through 18, and answer the question, why Christmas? God's Word says in verse 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Verse number six. There was a man sent from John whose name was, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. Verse nine. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Verse 14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about him and cried out, This was of he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks before me because he was before me. For from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only God who is at the Father's side. He has made him known. Let's pray together. Father, we love you today, and we are so grateful for this time that we celebrate Christmas. But Lord, there are many distractions and many different things going on in the minds of people during this season. And I pray, God, as we look at your word, that we would be zeroed in on why we actually need to celebrate Christmas, that this would ring true in our hearts and be a cause of rejoicing. And I pray, God, that there would be an eruption of our souls in praise to you when we recognize how amazing the fact that you came into this world truly is. And I pray, God, that there are people here in this room that maybe they don't know Jesus right now, but upon hearing your word, your Holy Spirit would break their hearts, convict them of their sin, and help them to see the truth that Jesus is Lord. I pray, God, that you would save them. Today is the day of salvation, and it's only in the name of Christ that salvation can be had. And I pray, God, that there would be salvations. And I pray that all of us would listen attentively, knowing that this is a word that will attend to our very situation. Whatever it is that we're going through, whether we're sad or happy or lonely or whatever we're feeling, God, you speak to our hearts. And I pray today that you would just have your way with everyone in this room. We love you and pray this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. 
so three reasons to celebrate Christmas, and we're just going to jump right in. The very first reason why Christians celebrate Christmas, why we as a church celebrate Christmas, is because Jesus shows love as the Word. The reason why we celebrate Christmas is Christmas is an introduction, an invitation to us to understand that God loves us. Even when we don't feel like we're loved, the Bible speaks clearly when we think about Christmas that Jesus does, in fact, love us. But you notice there that I say, as the word. You notice in verses 1 through 3 that Jesus is introduced as the word. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. He was in the beginning with God. And so this word, word, is mentioned several times. And you might scratch your head and say, what is the word? What's going on there? And we know it to be Jesus because down in verse 14 it says, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. You see, the Greek word is the word logos, but what does it mean when John says that Jesus is the word? Well, in the same way that when we say words, we are expressing our heart and our mind to other people, in the very same way God is expressing his heart, he's expressing his mind to us. Through Jesus, God the Father is saying a message to us. He is saying that he loves us. Words are expressed by letters, and Jesus is the Alpha and the Omega. He is the first and the last. According to Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, Jesus is God's last word to mankind. He is the climax and fulfillment of divine revelation. We don't have to sit at home, you know, twiddling our thumbs, wondering, God, are you going to give us another word? If we ask for another word, he says, Jesus, that's the word I'm going to give you. And so if you want to know about God, you look at Jesus. By calling Jesus the word, John was saying that Jesus has divine power and wisdom, and Jesus is the creator and the sustainer of the universe. And so let's look at three characteristics of Jesus as the word, and I'm going to wrap all these characteristics together to show you how it works that he loves us by being the word. Number one, Jesus is eternal. Jesus is eternal. That is that there is never a beginning with Jesus, and there will never be an end with Jesus. If you notice in verse 1, it says that the word was God. Before there was a beginning, the word had been co-equal with God, throughout all eternity. Jesus is not some lesser God. He is God, but yet he is also separate from the Father and from the Holy Spirit. This means then that there has never been a beginning with Jesus. There will be no end. He was before time. He has never been created. He is the great I am. Everything that we see has had a beginning, but there was no beginning with Jesus. He is eternal. The word being with God bears the idea of nearness. It implies a face-to-face relationship. So Jesus is a personal God. Before he came to Bethlehem, and it's important to note this, he had perfect, intimate, joyful, eternal fellowship with God the Father and God the Holy Spirit. This Jesus that we're talking about, and in order for you to understand how awesome Christmas is, you need to see who Jesus is before Christmas. He is eternal. But we also see, according to verse 3, that Jesus is creator. Jesus is creator. Verse 3 says, All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. And so if you say, well, I thought God was the creator, I would say, yes, that's correct. (laughs) And Jesus here is declared to be God and also the creator. Everything from subatomic particles to galaxies, from atoms to Adam, from mustard seeds to mountains, everything he created. If you look up at the sky and see the stars, every star that you can see, and even the billions of stars you can't see, were created by the Lord Jesus Christ. It is an amazing thought that everything that we see had a creation and a creator. The Bible says in Colossians chapter 1, verse 16, For by him, that is Christ, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created, note this part, all things were created through him and what? For him. And so if you want to know why you were created, for example, the answer is, is that you were created for him. 
You were created for the glory of God. Everything is created for the glory of God. The Bible speaks in Psalm 19 of the heavens declaring the glory of God. And it speaks about trees clapping their hands. All of creation shouts, God is glorious. And that's our job as well. In Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, the Bible says, Long ago at many times and in many ways God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things. Look at this. Through whom also he created the world. And so it's important for us to understand that since only God creates, this verse is telling us that Jesus is God. And it's not the only passage in scripture that says that. Colossians 1.15 says Jesus is the image of the invisible God. Hebrews 1, 3, he's the express image of his person. So I want you to see who God is, who Jesus is here. Jesus is eternal. Jesus is creator. But thirdly, as we look at the fact that Jesus shows love as the word, Jesus is revealer. In verse 14, the verse I read uh, all, earlier, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Notice this next part. We have seen his glory Glory as the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. This verse says that Jesus revealed God's glory. And so if you wanted to know what God's glory looked like, you look at how Jesus lived, how Jesus spoke. Everything Jesus did was a manifestation of the glory of God the Father. While Jesus was on this earth, his glory was veiled by his human flesh. At the Mount of Transfiguration, there were only a few select disciples that were able to get a preview of the glory of Jesus. But at his second coming, the veil is going to be taken off, and there's going to be a full display of the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's going to be an incredible moment, nothing like you have ever seen in this world. In verse 18, it says that no one has ever seen God, the only God, who is at the Father's side. He has made him known. And so if you want to know God, if in your heart of hearts there's a void in your heart, you're saying, how can I know God? How can I know about God? John says, you look no further than Jesus. If you go any other route, you're not going to learn about God, but it's through Jesus that you learn about God. You understand who he is. We know this in John 14, verses 6 and 7. You know verse 6, Jesus said to him, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. But then in verse 7, listen to what it says. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. So the way we are able to understand the Father is by knowing Jesus Christ. God, who cannot be known unless he reveals himself, became known because Jesus explains him to us that phrase he has made him know can be interpreted explain or interpret god interp jesus interprets the father for us we cannot know god or begin to understand him apart from his son jesus which means no other religion is going to be able to take you to god There are some of you perhaps in this room that are starting to think, well, I know there are people in other countries, and I know there are people who mean well, and I guess if they try really hard, that's going to take them to their own version of heaven. And I want to let you know here today that you're being deceived. The Bible says very clearly there's no other way to get to heaven except through Jesus Christ. There's no other way to know the Father except through Jesus Christ. All religions are not equal here. All religions are man-made except for this one here that is a relationship with Jesus Christ. So, in saying this, what does Jesus, being eternal and creator and revealer, have anything to do with him loving us? As I said there, Jesus shows love as the word, and as the word, he is eternal creator and revealer. And here it is. As the word, Christ reveals himself that he might restore our broken relationship with God. So Jesus being the word is a reminder of God's great love for us. And so we're now at December the 4th, and as we get every day and you do your advent calendar or however you recognize Christmas, you need to remember as you turn those calendar pages every single day, I'm reminded God loves me because he is the word. And then as we see in verse 14, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. 
at Christmas, the eternal creator Jesus left the glories of heaven to become a man. This is what the theologians call the incarnation. That is, he became flesh. God became flesh. Paul said this in Philippians chapter 2, verse 7. Speaking of Jesus, it says, But he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. That's what happened at Christmas. At Bethlehem, the word became flesh. He was born of the Virgin Mary, and he was conceived by the Holy Spirit. Jesus was still 100% God, and he also became 100% man. It was not a 50-50 or anything, whatever kind of percentages you want to say. 100% God, 100% man. He became a real person who could be seen, he could be heard, he could be touched. That's who Jesus became. The word dwelt there means to live in a tent. You see it there in verse 14. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. It means to live as in, in a tent. He was not a mere appearance. No, he was made in the likeness of men. He is Emmanuel, God with us. And you might ask the question, why then did Jesus have to become a man? And it's an important question for all of us to consider. Jesus had to be made in our likeness so that he could die for us. Jesus did not die for angels or animals. He didn't become either of those. He became a man so that he could die for mankind. His purpose was more than just being a good person or being a prophet or being a miracle worker or being a great teacher. Those are things that are true about him, but his purpose was to demonstrate his love by dying on the cross for your sins and for my sins. That's the reason Jesus came into this world. There are some people and even other religions that say, yes, I do believe there was a historical Jesus, but they miss why he came. He was born in the manger so that he would go to the cross. The Bible tells us in Romans chapter 5, verse 8, that God shows his love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. If you're here today and you're wondering, does anyone love me? I don't feel loved right now. Maybe that's what's going on in your heart. This is a lonely, lonely season for a lot of people. I am just here today to show you from the authority of God's word that God loves you. How do you know that? Jesus died for you. Nothing that is going on in your current circumstances changes that. Jesus, as the eternal word, is a reminder that he has always loved you, always seeking to woo you, always seeking to have a relationship with you. You can go through all of the 39 books of the Old Testament right before Jesus came in the New Testament, and all, everything that was going on in the Old Testament was God preparing the way to show you how much he loved you. Regardless of your present circumstances, the eternal word has an everlasting love for you. The proof is that Jesus went to the manger to go to the cross. And so the first reason that we should celebrate Christmas is because Jesus came showing his love. And I believe that that is reason to rejoice, reason to celebrate. And so I'm glad that it is Christmas. A second reason we celebrate Christmas is found in verses 4 through 13, that Jesus is not only the word, but we see that Jesus offers hope as the light. He offers hope as the light. There is a verse in Matthew chapter 4, verse 16. It says the people dwelling in darkness have seen a great light. And for those dwelling in the region in shadow of death, on them a light has dawned. It is a prophecy from Isaiah chapter 9, verse 2. And I want you to think about that. That is what was going on during the time when Jesus came into the earth. The world was covered in darkness, and God said, let there be light. Let my son be made flesh. That is what had happened. So I want to share with you three ways that the light, and the light is a person here, is Jesus Christ here, the light offers hope. Number one, Jesus shines light into darkness. Light and darkness are often used as symbols of knowledge and of morality. And so what I mean by that is, before Jesus, we don't know the truth. 
end, we don't act on the truth. We don't live the way we should, and so that's the morality. We don't know the way that we should, and so that is our knowledge. And so when light comes in, it takes away, it it removes the darkness. As light, Jesus brilliantly shines truth into the darkness of our human hearts. We didn't know God, and God shows us the truth through the light. We didn't live by the truth, and so God shines our, his, heart, his light on our hearts so that we begin to live for him. And then you see in verse 5, the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. This verse is a tremendous encouragement to believers. Even a small candle, the room was completely dark. If I just lit one small candle, it would begin to shine throughout the entire room, right? And this verse that I read there in verse 5 speaks of all the forces of Satan trying to prevent life and trying to extinguish the light, but they could not. Nothing Satan could do could stop Jesus from shining. And one day, that glorious, brilliant light of Jesus will completely destroy Satan's domain of darkness, and there will forever be light shining brilliantly, shining gloriously. This light has come. And as fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy, this light has brought hope. No longer do sinners have to be enslaved to their sin. We now have been set free by the light of Jesus. We no longer have to be enslaved to death and darkness. But because of Jesus, we now know him. We now have experienced his freedom. No longer do we need to be deceived by the lies of Satan or deceived by the lies of the world. We know the truth and we have a relationship with the truth. Light has come. Then you see in verse 9, it says there that the true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. You see, there's fake light all around us. It's not real light, correct? But Jesus is not artificial light. He is the true light because he is the only way for the darkness of our hearts to be lit. So the first way in which Jesus offers hope is we need to understand that Jesus shines light in the darkness. Secondly, Jesus raises life from the dead. His light gives life. Now note this, Jesus is self-existent, which means he has life within himself. He is dependent on no one for life. You got your life, but it didn't come from yourself, right? It was given to you. God was, Jesus was never given life. He always has been life. And so he's the only one that can give life. Jesus' life, verse 4 says, was the light of men. In 1 John chapter 5, verse 12, it says, Whoever has the Son has life, and whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. Since Jesus is self-existent, only he could give life. You can't find life in anyone or anything else. And then let's jump down to verse 13. It says there, The children of God who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. This verse speaks of being born again. We have all had our physical birth, but not everybody has experienced a spiritual birth. Without Jesus, we are all spiritually dead. But when we receive Jesus, he shines his light into our hearts, our dark hearts, and he breathes his life into us, and we are born again, and we are raised to walk in newness of life. And so it's not about being born a Jew or a Gentile. It's about being born again. The point of the end of verse 13, as it says there in that verse, not of blood, not of the will of flesh or the will of man, but of God. The idea is that it's impossible for us to save ourselves. The only one who could give life is Jesus. And so you have to receive life through him. There's no other way to get life. This is a reason to rejoice. And there's a third way we have hope as Jesus is the light, that Jesus not only shines the light in our darkness and raises life from the dead, but Jesus transforms the old into new. Jesus didn't come just to change our December 25th traditions, right? That's not the reason he came into this world. He came to change our life, and he came to make us new. So in verse 12, we see the first way we are made new. I'll read that verse to you. It says, but to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. 
He gave that right to become children of God. So one way in which we are new is that we have a new family. When we are saved, we are adopted into God's family as his sons and his daughters. So this means that this is our identity. The old labels that the world has put on us have passed away, and we are now his children. We represent our father, and we live for him in his kingdom. This means it's about a relationship. This is how I keep saying this, and I've said it over and over again, that Christianity is not so much about a religion as it is a relationship. And how do you know that? Because God calls us sons and daughters. And if you have a father or a mother, you know that if you have that, that relationship with them, it's about communication. It's about spending time with them. And the Bible says that you are his son. You are his daughter. And it's about that closeness, that relationship. In Galatians chapter 4, verse 4, it says, But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might, listen to this, receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our heart, crying, Abba, Father. The word Abba, Father is a sermon in and of itself, but let me just say this. Whenever you see that word used in scripture, it is always used in the context of suffering. And so when you're struggling and when life doesn't make sense, understand he's always our Abba, Father. He's always there. He never leaves us and never forsakes us. John, who wrote this gospel, never got over the fact that he was a child of God. I think every day he woke up and said, thank you, Jesus, that I am a child of the living God. How do we know that? In 1 John chapter 3, verse 1, I love this verse. He says, see what kind of love the Father has given to us. Another translation says, see what kind of love the Father has lavished on us. God has lavished you with his love. Well, how do we know that, John says, that we should be called children of God. Again, you wake up and wonder, am I loved? You're a child of the living God. You have been greatly loved. In verses 6 through 8 of this passage of Scripture in John 1, we see not only that we have a new family, but we also have a new purpose. It mentions John the Baptist, and he was the first prophet in 400 years to the nation of Israel. He is, was the voice crying out in the wilderness, make straight the path of the Lord in Matthew 3.3. 3. He fearlessly confronted sin, and he told the people to repent and believe in the Lamb of God who takes away all the sin of the world. As Jesus' forerunner, John gave witness to Jesus. He told others who he was and why he came. And we have that same mission. Our mission is to testify about Jesus, why Jesus came into this world, and how Jesus has changed our life. And so as Deborah had come earlier, earlier and she was sharing about the Lottie Moon Christmas offering, here's something I don't ever want you to forget, that Christmas is a call to missions. Christmas is a call to missions, that as we have received hope, we are to give hope to others. That is why we have been saved. And so we're talking about why we celebrate Christmas, and we've seen that God, that Jesus shows his love as the word, and we see that Jesus offers hope as the light. But there's a third reason we celebrate Christmas, and it is this, that Jesus extends grace as the Son. We see this in verses 14 through 18. Jesus is God's Son. And the phrase that you see several times, especially in the book of John, only begotten, here it is in verse 14, it does not imply that Jesus was created by God and thus not eternal. But no, the, the phrase only begotten describes Jesus as unique, the only one of his kind. In the Old Testament, you remember Abraham. He had many sons, but Isaac was the one that was called the only begotten, even though he had a brother that was older than him, Ishmael. We see that in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 17. And so when we are saved, we are adopted as sons of God, but we are not like the son of God. There is a unique and special relationship between God and the, God the Father and God the Son. And so with that, with that thought in mind, I want to give you three thoughts about how Jesus extends grace as the Son of God. Number one, we need to realize the purpose of the law. As we look at this text of Scripture, we see, especially in verse 17, for the law 
was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. The law reveals sin, but it never removes sin. So when you read of the Ten Commandments, they say, do not do this, do not do this. And when we do it, we know that we have transgressed. We know that we have sinned. So the law was never put into place to remove our sin. It provides, that is, the law provides God's standard of righteousness, which could never be met. There isn't any of us that have lived a perfect life. You can't read through the Bible and say, check, got that, give me something harder to do. No, whenever we read the Bible, sometimes we feel about that small. And the reason is, is because we've all sinned. We've all fallen short. But where can we find forgiveness? As you look at verse 17, this is a message of hope that the law was given through Moses. And we know we've broken God's law. And we know we're condemned. We know we're guilty. We know we don't deserve heaven. What hope is there? But you read the next part of that verse. Read the next part of that verse. In verse 17, it says, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. So when the law condemns, Jesus came and brought the cross. Jesus came with the fullness of grace and truth. And this fullness is available to all who trust him. The law shows us that we are sinners and we don't deserve salvation. But grace triumphs over the law. But here's the thing. We have to receive his grace. You have to receive his gift. So two ways in which we receive his gift. To begin with, we receive Jesus by grace. As you see there in verse number 14, it it speaks about uh, Jesus and his glory. And, And then as we read in verse 17, it says grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. We receive Jesus by grace. Jesus is the full expression of God's truth and God's grace. You want to know what truth looks like? Look at Jesus. If you want to know what grace looks like, look at Jesus. Grace is God's unmerited favor. It cannot be earned. It is not deserved. It is a gift from God. Salvation is a gift. And there you see in verse 12, the word that is I want to bring out and focus on is that word receive. To receive God and receive Jesus, it's more than intellectual assent. There are some of you in this room where if I ask you, do you believe Jesus is the son of God? Yeah, sure, I believe that. Do you believe in all the Christmas story? Yeah, sure, I believe that. But it doesn't have any kind of impact on your heart because you have not yielded to him. And we'll see what that means in just a minute. And it's not only head knowledge. There are some of you that know all the facts of of the Bible and can recite them at a moment's notice. But yet that's not really what it means to receive Jesus. I think the key to understanding what receive means comes at the end of that phrase in verse 12 where it says, who believe in his name. This is key because the phrase in his name speaks of the totality of who Jesus is. And so if you want to receive Jesus, you have to believe in his name. And in his name, it means you have to believe in who he is, not who you want him to be. See, there are some people who think they can receive Jesus just as long as they still make the rules. Oh, I can go to church every now and then. I'll put some money in the offering plate every now and then. I'll, I'll try to be a good person. And they try to make the rules. And they say, yeah, I've received Jesus. But no, you receive him in his name, which means he's not only Savior, but he's Lord. He's Savior and Lord. And so when you receive him, you receive him as Savior and Lord. You acknowledge and you surrender yourself, as we sang earlier. I surrender all. I don't hold anything back because you're Lord. I'm waving the white flag. You are king. So to to be saved, we have to receive him in his name, and we're saved by grace. But we're also saved, and we receive Jesus through faith. As you notice there, as we continue to read, it says, Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ in verse 17. So that word truth is the word I want you to think about. Do you believe Jesus says he is the truth, and it's up to you to believe. He's not going to force that upon you. He's not going to hold you down and say, believe in me. He's not going to do that. He says, I am the truth. Now it's up to you whether you are going to believe in that or not. The light is shining. Are you going to take your dark heart and turn away from it? Are you going to take your dark heart and surrender and say, come on, Lord Jesus. In John chapter 20, verse 31, it says, but these are written so that you may 
believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that my, by believing you may have life in his name. The reason John wrote John chapter 1, the sermon I just read, the te- passage I just read, the reason why he wrote the entire book is for you to believe. He is telling you, this is who Jesus is. And you can read through John, and he has these I am statements throughout. He has all these incredible miracles and teachings. And John says, I wrote all of this to you. In fact, the reason why all of the Bible's written is so that you would believe. You have to have faith. As we see in verse 12, it says, the all who did receive him, and what do they do? They believed in his name. The tragedy is, is that the Jews that waited centuries for their Messiah and their Savior to come. When Jesus finally came, they rejected him. They refused to believe. They did not have faith. Jesus came, and everything he did, everything he said, showed the glory of God, and they said, we want life for ourselves. I don't want to surrender to that. Today, many people reject him. They love their sin. They love their darkness. They hate the truth. And they refuse to believe. Now, people love either the light or the darkness. And this love controls their actions. If you want to know why someone is doing what they do, it is a reflection of the love that they have in their heart. The reason why people chase after dark things is because they have darkness in their heart. The reason why we want to follow Jesus and tell people about Jesus we have Jesus in our heart. But Jesus came because the truth sets us free. We sang earlier about the living hope. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord for the one who set me free. Truth is shining in the hearts. Now you not only know about Jesus, but now you can live for Jesus. You see, salvation is not just about knowing that you're going to go to heaven, knowing that you've been forgiven. That's part of it. But salvation is also sanctification where you have been set free from the power of sin. The Holy Spirit doesn't live in your life and in your heart so that you can dirty up your heart. He lives so that you become more like Christ. The light is shining, but we're left with a choice. Will you reject him or will you receive him? At this time, I'd like to invite our musicians to come to the stage, our praise band. Also, we need some counselors over here at this door as we're transitioning to a time of invitation. So the question I introduced the sermon with was this question, why Christmas? And I tried to answer it today looking at this text, seeing that Jesus is the word, he's the light, and he's the son. And as those three characteristics of Jesus What I see is that there are three things that he does that should cause us to celebrate Christmas. He shows love. He shows us his love. He offers us his hope, and he extends his grace to us. This message of Christmas makes little sense without understanding of what happened on Easter. Jesus was born to die, and then after dying, he rose from the dead. And so if you think of Jesus and you just think of Christmas as the, the Messiah coming, being born in the manger, you only got a part of the story. That baby that was born, it was God made flesh, but he came to go to the cross. And if you take the cross and you take the grave, if you take that away from Christmas, it makes no sense. Jesus did all this to show his love for us and to offer eternal life and forgiveness only through him. So today, God is offering this free gift of salvation to anyone who believes in his name. The Bible says in a famous John 3, 16 verse, For God so loved the world that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. Jesus was God's gift. If you are ready to receive him, Understand that we don't receive him just by understanding facts or just by saying, yeah, I believe that. But we yield to who he is, his name. He's Savior and Lord. Today, I want to invite you to pray with me. And if you've already received Jesus as your Savior and Lord, I want to invite you to pray for others in this room. 
The Holy Spirit is working. And so if you know today that you haven't truly committed yourself to Jesus, you know about Christmas and you've heard all the stories, but you never thought about how God has given his love to us and his hope and his grace to us. Today, I want to invite you to bow and pray these words to God at this time. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. And I know that my sin separates me from you. But I believe that you still love me. You loved me enough to die on the cross for my sins. And you rose from the dead. And you're alive today. Jesus, come into my life. Shine light through the darkness of my heart. That I might have your life. Save me today, Lord Jesus. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, I want to invite you to come down the aisle when this music starts. For others, I want you to marvel at the message of Christmas and allow these truths to transform your heart. As the Spirit leads, I want to invite you to come down this aisle. It might be that you need to come down and confess sin. It might be that you need to come and you need to pray for others. It might be that you have questions about what it means to be a member of the church or questions about baptism. Jesus came to show love, to offer hope, and to extend grace. And so as the Holy Spirit is moving, we all need to move in his direction. Come to Jesus. Let's all stand together. And as the Holy Spirit is moving, I'll be here in the front. We have counselors over here at this door. Let's be obedient to Christ and come to him.
cross as you wait for the crown. Tell the world of the treasure you found. Amen. Go ahead and be seated. There are several announcements, and uh, we also have a, a budget vote that we need to do here in just a moment. won't take long, but uh, announcements uh, to begin with. We are collecting for Lottie Moon here in the month of December. You're going to be hearing a lot about that. International missions offering, very important offering. encourage you to give as the Lord would lay upon your heart. Also, next Sunday, December the 11th, we are having a, a lot of programs. We're going to have our adult choir program during the worship service in the morning. And then the children's uh, program will be that evening at 5 o'clock. And so be in prayer. Invite your friends and family. It's going to be a glorious time. Look forward to that. Also want to make sure everybody's aware that tonight at the Hoax Bluff uh, Park Gazebo, there is a special Christmas tree lighting at 6 o'clock. And so if you'd like to come out, they've asked some of the area pastors to pray, read scripture, and things like that. should be a very brief little service, but I want to make sure you're invited to that. Um, we also need to make sure we vote on Inslee Wissanat joining the church. And so Inslee was baptized today, so she'll be coming through baptism. And so if you rejoice in that, would you signify by saying amen? Amen. amen. Certainly glad to have Inslee uh, with us and excited about what the Lord's doing in her heart and in her life. All right, let's go ahead and transition to this time of voting on the budget then. Brother Jeff Carnes is here, and he's going to lead us in that. On November 6th at the quarterly business meeting, the 2023 budget team, which is myself, Jim Guidry, Barry Wheeler, David Dwight, Terry Estes, presented the 2023 proposed budget for a motion uh, as accepting the budget. The motion was seconded and opened for the floor for discussion. Today on December 4th, the 2023 budget team called for a vote to approve the proposed budget as the 2023 budget for the First Baptist Church takes place. All right. And so with that, uh, we already had time for discussion. So if you approve of the budget as stated on that report, would you signify by standing with us at this time? Well, amen. God has been faithful to provide for the church. And now everybody else, if you don't mind to, to stand with us, we are going to sing out. God bless you for being here. Excited about what the Lord is doing. Is there a real, real, real quick announcement anybody has? Christmas blessings, yes. Right, so donate the Christmas blessings. We also have a beautiful Christmas drop out drop um, scene. If you want to get a picture here, uh, so please be sure to get your family picture taken over there. Not drop out. All right, let's all sing together. <laughs> Quick reminder: four o'clock this afternoon. Choir will meet back here today at four o'clock. Thanks.